Okay, back to the hellfire preaching of Shantideva. Actually, Shantideva, that name you know, is the, the God of Peace. Well, okay, maybe you've got to go through the hellfire preaching before you get to the real peace. Here we are. Let me... Here we are. Nirudjima Palanka Kshin Sukumara Bahuviata. All that's meant to be in a very kind of sarcastic, oh, you poor little Didam's tone. Nirudjima Palanka Kshin Sukumara Bahuviata. Mrityugrasto Marakara Hadokita Vihanyase. And once more, Nirudjima. Palakankshin Sukumara Bahuviata Mrityugrasto Marakara Adokita Vihanyase Nirudyama. The the root. Hang on, let me get back to shared screen. There we are. The root yam is a highly productive root and it crops up again and again. It's everywhere. Um, the essential meaning of the root yam is a pushing or a pulling, an exertion of effort. An exertion of effort is the basic underlying meaning. And if you put the prefix ah in front of it, the ayam, it's like a pulling towards, it's like a, a restraining or controlling. Sorry, is somebody calling me or is that a voice in the background? Okay. And the verbal noun. So all this is that this isn't rabbit hole. This this is all mainline stuff. Learn this. The noun is ayama. Now, where do we have ayama? Well, for the yogis among you, you have the pranayama, which is breath control. That's from the same root yam, ayama. The the pulling in, the restraining, controlling. Let's think of a tug of war, pushing away and pulling towards the tug of war, the strife, the straining. Somebody else is pulling away from you, you're pulling back from them. So, ayama, pulling towards you, viyama, pushing away from you, the struggle. V plus ayama. In by santi, the V plus A becomes via like this. Viyama, that is viyama pushing away, ayama pulling towards. In Pali, there's a reason for this, so in Sanskrit, samyag vyayama in Pali becomes samavayama, which is part of the noble eightfold path, right effort. So the word that's used for effort, the right effort or right endeavor in the noble eightfold path is Pali vayama, Sanskrit vyayama the away and towards pulling, the strife. It's like the, 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 the tug of war, you're exerting force against a counter force. And if you just take the word vyama alone, v plus, sorry, vyama, 
in Sanskrit, in Pali, becomes Vyama, Vama or Vyama. It means the, the span, the Vyama, the stretching out of the arm. So it's the, the arm span. And where the Buddha is recorded as saying, here in this six foot span, in other words, within the human body, or just here within this arm span, is deliverance to be one. He's talking about the, the Vayama, here in the Vayama, the, the span of the human body, how far you can stretch your, stretch your arms out. So back now to Ud. So Ud means cognate with our English word out or up. The idea is coming up out of something, Udyama. So striving upwards. So the Udyama means an endeavor. having to work for it, not just sitting there waiting for it to come to you, having to work for it. Let's get back to our text here. Nirudyama. So this yam here, that's the central root of the word, the yam. The same yam I've just been giving you. Nirudyama, nir, without. It's, you know, equivalent if we say something less, meaning without it, it doesn't have it. So effortless, nir udyama. So the udyama, the effort, nir udyama, if without an effort. But generally in a, in a pejorative sense, not as in English we might say talking about doing something with effortless ease. No, this is the, the pejorative something, pejorative meaning. You're hoping for results, but without putting anything in. You're hoping just to sit back and hoping it'll all come to you. Well, it won't. The udyama is needed. The nirudyama without putting in the effort. Nirudyama pala kankshin. Right, so pala, sorry, let me get back to iPad. Pala. And pala, hopefully you know by now, it means a fruit. In fact, it's cognate with the um, English word fruit. And, you know, the Latin fructus. The pala, in, in the literal sense, a fruit as a, a thing growing on a tree. Um, but in the figurative sense, very often, um, used to the um, the result of an of an action um, in the doctrine of karma, for example, we get the um, pala vipaka. Vipaka meaning the ripening, the ripening of the fruit, and we could also talk about the kamma vipaka. Sorry, karma, of course, in Sanskrit. Karma or Kama Vipaka. So you're wanting this Pala without the effort. Now, back to our text. Nirutuma Pala Kankshin. The akankshin, there's the root kanksh, which is actually ultimately derived from the simpler root kam, as in karma, karma, meaning desire, sense, pleasures, and so on. So the root kanksh, you Sorry, sorry, thank you, I didn't notepad. Here we are, um, I forgot where I forgot to come back. Okay, pala fruit, pala vipaka and so on, kanksh. So it's normally found with the prefix a, with the, effectively the same meaning. So a kanksh, somebody a kankshati. It means to, you know, to have an aspiration for, to desire something, to long for it. Um, so a longing, aspiration, expectation, hope that you'll get it, your akanksha. 
um, very often used in um, the sense of you know, the the you know, the the longing for the the aspiration towards the the spiritual life. It's often used in that sense. In fact, it's used as a the the noun akanksha. Akanksha. It's actually used um, in, mod in, in modern India even as, as, as a girl's name, aspiration. Um, the last girl I knew who was called Akanksha, a fellow undergraduate friend of a son of mine at university, shortened it to AK. And you know, I just could not get her to understand what a dreadful travesty it was, this beautiful name Akanksha. Everyone just called her AK. Goodness me. Ah, oh, well, she went on being called AK. The elderly Sanskritisms were not accepted on that occasion. <laughs> so Akanksha is therefore this aspiration, wish, the hope. Now, very, very many adjectives are formed by the changing the final vowel of a word to in, meaning one who does something or has something. You already know it because you already know the word yoga. Hmm? And a person who does yoga is a yogi. Okay, yogin is the stem form. The masculine singular is yogi, it becomes a long e, yogi. Note that in the vocative, when you are talking to somebody, that in remains as is. So, hey, yogi, you say, hey, yogin. Hmm? And here it is for you. Nirudyama. Hang on, there we are. Palakankshin. Look at this in at the end that I've highlighted. That is the Akanksha is the desire or the wish. The Akankshin, nominative form Akankshi, evocative form Akankshin, is a person who has a wish. So, Pala Akankshin is a person who desires a result, a result desirer. Pala Akankshin, nominative Pala Akankshi. So, Nirudjuma Pala Akankshin is one. It's a double compound. It means, hey, you, without effort, fruit desirer. That, hey, you, hoping you'll achieve something without having to work for it, is what it means. Nirudyama palakankshin. Sukumara bahuvyata. Sukumara, we had before, you kind of delicate little creature. Oh, somebody mentioned in the last session um, that the, the Buddha having been referred to as the, the delicate one, um, I wasn't able to find any original reference to that. So if anyone has found it, you know, please, um, please post it in the, in, in, in the chat. So I, I, I drew a blank while trying, trying to find that. So, Nirujima Palakankshin Sukumara Bahuvyata. So, Sukumara, we've had Bahuvyata. To iPad. So, Bahu. Sorry, short. Ooh, bahu um, is as an adjective, also as the, the first member of a compound, it just, just means much. So, bahu vyata, it means something like uh, long suffering, much suffering. Bahu vyata, through vyat. Root vyat originally actually means to, to, to tremble and then to, to suffer or to be sorrowful. So, make an adjective out, a compound adjective, bahu vyata, much trembling or much sorrowing, long suffering translated here. So, Sukumara, delicate, Bahuvyata, long suffering. All of these are vocatives. 
except Mrityu Grasto, which is a nominative. And I'm just wondering whether there's an error in the text there. I, I think it ought, ought to be a, it ought to be a, a vocative. Um, but I'll come back to that detail in, in, in a moment. Mrityu Grasto. This is the Mrityu Grasto Marakara. This is where we get the Grasta Amarakara by Santi becomes Grasto Marakara. By the way, this little bit of Sandhi here, I'm going to teach you a little phrase now. You'll ne never forget it. So a word ending in ah, followed by another word beginning in ah, by Sandhi becomes o, oh, like that. Look at this little phrase, homage be to the Buddha. We know Buddhaya, this is the dative, Buddhaya, Buddha the Buddha, Buddhaya, sorry, keep forgetting to, keep forgetting to, <laughs> thank you for reminding me, Odin. <laughs> ah plus ah becomes the O, right? Buddha, the Buddha, okay. The dative, Buddhaya, We know that homage is namas, or namah on its own. It becomes namas as in namaste, homage to thee. That's by Santi, the final ah becomes an S before T. So buddhaya namah, just homage to the Buddha, buddhaya namah. Or you can say Namo Buddhaya, Buddhaya Namaha. Now, let's look. Probably most of you will have got this word now, the word asti, meaning there is or it is. You, oops, you can change it into an imperative, a third person imperative, meaning let there be, by changing this final e to u. Astu. Many of you may know the expression in Pali, very similar to Sanskrit, um, Pali sabbe sata sukita hontu. Hontu, may they be, let them be. If you said sabbe sata sukita hunti, the indicative, that would simply be an, a, a palpably incorrect statement, meaning all beings are happy. But sabbe sata sukita hontu, change that final t to tu, and you make it an, like an imperative, may, be, may they be. So astu is another form of saying, let it be, may it be. Now, buddhaya, it goes buddhaya namostu. So you and I will always remember this ah plus ah becoming o oh by saying you don't say buddhaya namah astu without the Sunday namah astu, but then buddhaya namostu. Buddhaya namostu. By the way, for those of you who were worried about the Sunday, Please be terrified that this is just the tip of the iceberg. But never mind. Actually, if you, if you, that, that's the bad news. The good news is that apart from little quirks like ah, astu becoming ustu, apart from little quirks like that, there is actually a good reason behind it. If, if you just go into soft focus, problem is looking at this, these Santi rules in Sanskrit. If you look at it with hard focus, that's the rule, got to learn it. That's the rule, got to learn it then it becomes prickly. If you learn the rule, then go back into soft focus and see why the vocal organs, why it's happening like that. You say, ah, oh, there's actually a reason for it. So you just, you know, look at, look at the rule, but then 
as it were, go into soft focus and relax yourself into it, and all becomes clearer as, as we go along. So back to text. Mrityu grasto marakara. So this grasto marakara is as in, sorry, my cursor's cursor has been playing me up. So grasto marakara is grasta amarakara. So mrityu grasto. Again, this is the nominative. Slightly odd that it should be. I would have expected evocative. Never mind. So the root gras. Sorry. Yeah. Whew. Remembered that time before Odin got to me. So gras. Gras is to, well, to grasp actually, but also to bite, to grip in the teeth. If you're in the jaws of something, you are gra past possible grasta. And mrityu, we know, is meaning death. So death bitten, as though death has kind of seized you in its jaws. You're in the jaws of death. Death bitten. Not just bitten and gone away, but actually holding you in its fangs. I didn't think we actually have a separate English word for, 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 for that. So, mrichu grasto amarakara. Amarakara. So, from this root, mri. Sorry, back to this root, the root mri, meaning to die. Um, it's cognate, you know, with mortal and so on, the Latin mors. Actually, our English word moor, as in, you know, Dart moor and, and Bodmin moor, that, that kind of auction moor, it means dead land. It's not actually dead, but um, just rough grass that the, the, the sheep can eat, but you can't cultivate the moor, the high rough land that, from that same root meaning dead, dead land. So, mri. And from that root, mri, we get mara. So, amara, undying. So it's an immortal. So the word amara is cognate with the immortal, undying. So you're in the jaws of death, but you're acting as if you're immortal. It's amarakara. A root kri, cognate with create, you know, to, to make. If you also to put um, the akara, it's the verbal noun from kri, kara, akara, with the prefix a, it means something you're putting on. So the akara is an external form. And the idea is um, it's a show that you're putting on, an external form, an akara. So if you're amarakara, amara plus akara, by very simple santi, this just merges into one long a, ah, so amarakara means behaving as if or putting on the show, acting as if you're immortal. That, hey, you are in the jaws of death, you're mrityu grasta, death seized in the jaws of death, but amarakara, acting as if putting on a show, behaving as if you are immortal. to text. Ha duhkita vihanyase. So we'll just look at this phrase here. Ha duhkita vihanyase. This 
this um, exclamation ha very often means in Sanskrit, like, alas, it's an expression of horror or fear. And you can say ha ha, repeating it, meaning a laugh, but it's most often used as an expression of, of horror. Um, in fact, in an earlier verse, we had ha hatosmi. I'm going to give you this now in detail again, just to fix this bit of sandhi in your mind. We, we had ha hata, I mean killed. And you'll all know now the correct sandhi for that is ha hatosmi. So ha hata asmi becomes ha hatosmi. Means, alas, I'm killed or about to be killed. I'm, I'm a dead man. So, ha duh kita. Oops, sorry. Oop, come. There we are. Ha duh kita vihanya se. Okay. Duh kita. Okay, we all know dukka. Dukkha, in Pali, of course, Dukkha. Dukkha as both a noun and an adjective. You can make a verb out of it. You can make, a, there are so many nouns out of which you can make, make verbs. And the verb is dukkayati, meaning to cause suffering to somebody. It's um, a transitive causative verb. The, and this is a very, very common past participle I'm going to show you from the verbs in ayati. The ayati just becomes ita, that's the past participle. You're on the notepad, James. Sorry, sorry. Hang on. There we are. Had you got the ha ha me on the notepad before? Okay, dukkha, dukkha, dukhayati, to cause pain. It's like a causative ending. So dukkha actually literally means um, he causes dukkha. And the past participle, one to whom dukkha has been caused, one who has been made to suffer, is dukkita. So he's saying, ha dukkita, oh, you who have been thrown into suffering, made to suffer. That's dukkita, not just suffering, but made to suffer. It's the result of a causative action. Vihanya se. Text again. Ha dukhita. Again, dukhita, ending in just a simple a, so that's the vocative form. Vihanya se. We'll just look at this word now on the, sorry. We'll look at this now on the iPad. Vihanyase. It means to be tormented or to be beaten up. It's actually quite an interesting word in several respects. Let's look at it. So the root is han. The root han means originally to hit, but then more often, or very frequently, hata, it means to kill. And the past participle is hata, which is hey, ha, hatosmi. It's that same hata. Literally, I am killed. Like, oh, I'm a dead man. I'm about to be killed. So hata is actually cognate with our English word hit. 
Now, V, we know the prefix V, the idea of often with a violent action or something apart. So Vihan, sorry, Vihan, means literally to, to hit apart, to strike apart. And it means to be kind of beaten up. And the and then in the extended sense of tormenting. So you are vihanyase, you are tormented. And it could mean also you, it's the the, the passive form of the verb, by the way, vihanyase. So vihanyase, you are you are tormenting yourself. I mean, in the Dhammapada, you've got the man who says, hey, I have, I have children, I have wealth, blah, blah, blah. Vihanyasi, vihanyati. He's uh, tormenting himself there by the, oh, how wonderful. You know, I, I have progeny, I have wealth. But all he's doing is vihanyate. He's beating himself up. He's tormenting himself. So vihan to beat up, to torment, and the passive form, the regularly formed, the han, put the y in for the passive, and the atmane for the form, the hanyase, the hanyase, you're beating yourself up. Often used um, in the Buddhist scripture by saying, you are needlessly, the hanyase, you are needlessly, the implication, you are needlessly causing yourself torment by the way that you're acting. In this verse, I construe it to mean, where are we? Vihanyase, here it's translated by the skeleton corners, um, skeleton Crosby brothers, you are destroying yourself. Yeah, beating yourself to, to, to pieces. So in other words, you don't know you're doing it, but by ignoring the dangers, that is what you are in fact doing to yourself. Oh, I just in case I forget, I've just received um, two emails, one from Jan, one from GH, saying hope that I got the email correctly. Yes, it's, it's here, I've got it. I see a clapping of hands there. Okay, oh, very good. So vihanyase, beating yourself up. Um, actually, this highlights a very interesting distinction between the way Shantideva and the Bodhicari Avatara is advising us to act. And the way that in modern times, people so often advise each other to act or not to act, which even among Buddhists, which Shantideva would have found dreadful advice, indeed harmful advice to give. Because we so often hearing, hear people saying nowadays, don't beat yourself up. Hmm? And Shantideva would say, well, look, your problem is you aren't beating yourself up enough. You're sitting back, lolling about, Nirudjima Palakanchin, desiring fruit without effort, Mrityu Grasto Marakara, pretending you're immortal, making a show of being immortal, Mrityu Grasto, when you're in the jaws of death. Well, a bit of beating up is just what you need now. So, very often, if they don't beat yourself up, is the worst advice, according to Shanti Deva that you could ever give, give, give anyone. So we are pretty much winding up on this verse. Um, if there are any questions about it before I read it back slowly, or indeed after I read it back slowly, please ask them either by, you know, either by waving on screen or putting an, an, a message into the, into the chat box. Anyway, let me um, let me read it through slowly. Nirudyama palakankshin sukumara bahuvyata 
मृत्यु ग्रस्तो मराकारा हा तुहकिता विहन्य से नाउ आई एम कॉन्शियस दैट दिस इज नॉट रियली अ देवनागरी स्क्रिप्ट क्लास हाउएवर I am equally conscious um that the array of you who are so kind as to put up with me for the bodhicharya avatara classes are broadly the same as those who attend the thomas eginus grammar classes and it won't be long um before you're actually going to have to get yourselves into the De- devanagari script so you may regard yourselves for the if you have not been getting on with the devanagari script you may regard yourselves as being mrchugrasta marakara as being mrchugrasta has been seized in the jaws of death amarakara pretending that you're immortal so what i'm going to do just a little bit now i was going to say with your permission but i'm going to do it anyway um is just give give you a, <clears throat> a tiny little bit of a couple of the simpler bits of the devanagari script you know i think three or four more lessons of um, eginus and were and were onto it by the way with um, the thomas eginus book it's all all of the exercises are in roman script so far you know two or three lessons time i forget the one it will be in devanagari with roman and then we go on to devanagari alone but for those of you who um haven't followed the devanagari lessons so far um yeah you've got to learn new lessons and you've got to learn the ligatures the way letters are joined to each other um okay that's the bad news um but the good news is uh, sorry what what was that to aiden what book were you showing me on screen there sorry uh, uh, put it up in front of your camera again Oh the Sanskrit alphabet excellent very good very good <laughs> excellent you will be the first one that i ask to read the first sentence in the devanagari script when we get there <laughs> good all good so um, so yes anyway the good news is that the devanagari the way sanskrit is written in devanagari is very very regular and where a, where you see a word written ignoring pitch for the moment which only is valid for vedic but for ordinary classical sanskrit which is what we're doing whenever you see a word written you always know how it's pronounced because the script is so regular so there's quite a bit of learning to do at the early stage what they call upfront learning but once you've learned learned it you've got it there aren't any horrible surprises as you as you find with english for example you know words being pronounced in completely unexpected ways it doesn't happen in 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 sanskrit and it's a bit like you know in modern spanish for example um you know you can always tell from the way a word is written how it's pronounced in spanish one of the few modern languages where that term applies to where that applies so let's look at this word Uh, let's take a terribly simple one here we are i've highlighted it there on the screen and that is ha slight devanagari lesson now ha okay let me go to my ipad that is the letter ha this is the long vowel r but remember when you join a consonant to a following vowel they merge you use a vowel sign you don't write the full sign you don't you see this r at the beginning of a sentence or a word group because ha let's change it ha so the ha plus the r is written as the h but just w- one upstroke for the r so that is ha we have the letter ta but if put that long stroke next to it and that makes it into a 
Ta. I'll give you one other bit now. We're the su Sukumara. Sukumara. Let's analyze that. That's quite an easy one. Yeah, let's do that one. Back to iPad. Sukumara. So this is the letter. It's the S. Tha. By the way, hopefully you all know this by now that where you write a Devanagari consonant without any other marker or vowel sign, it's what it has what's known as the inherent a. Ah. So what I've written there is not just an, the letter S, it's the sound sa. If you want to write it so that there's no vowel after it, just a s, you put this little mark underneath this tiny little mark there called the virama, meaning stopping or pausing, means that, that there's no vowel. Virama, little rabbit hole here. Virama means pause or a stop. And you get an alternative form of veramani, meaning a pausing or a stopping. Many of you will have chanted that word as in Musavada Vairamani Sikapadam Samadhyami. That's in, 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 in Pali. Sikapadam Samadhyami, I, I adopt the training rule. Musavada, you know, full speech. Panatipata Vairamani, the taking of life Vairamani, the ceasing, the stopping, the ref, refraining from. That's that same Virama, Vairamani. Means a pause, stopping, not doing it anymore. Cease and desist. So, sa. Back to where we were. The vowel, full vowel sign for u is like that. But as usual, you would only see it at the beginning of a word group or at the beginning of a sentence. For example, uddiyama, um, the word. Uddiyama, we've just had. Uddiyama. Meaning effort. Oh, just to whet your appetite, in case you were wondering what this funny shape was, it's a d plus a y, because that's the d. That's a year. When you join them together, I'm afraid you can't just put a d and then followed by a year. The Devanagari is not quite as simple as that. You kind of you you make a new sign. You kind of join them together like like, like that. And again, I repeat this advice. It can look ferociously complicated at an early stage. If you just look at it and then go into soft focus, you can say, oh yeah, you can see how if you join a d with a y, you can see the first part of the shape of the d, the, but then you go on to the y. So it's like a joining of a d and the y, you can see the essential element of the d and the essential element of the y. Sorry, I'm getting lost in my rabbit holes now. Where were we? Yes, sa plus u. Sa plus u here. So we don't want to say sa u, we want to say su. So what do we do? We write the letter S, but we put this little thing there. So the full form of an u is like that, but where it's a vowel following a consonant, it becomes this little sign underneath. For example, this is a ba. And I'm now going to write the first syllable of the word buddha. There we are. The written bu. That's the bu of buddha.
This is a k. We've got sukumara, suku. Look at this. So, su, ku. Suku. This is the letter M. Note again, in almost all cases, for the Devanagari letters, it's got the characteristic shape of it with an upright and a crossbar. So if you're writing Devanagari and somebody writes that, it's an incomplete M, but you, oh, I've got it. Without anything else, you know it's going to be an M because that is the characteristic shape of the M. To write it as a complete letter, then you have the upright and your crossbar. So, Sukumara. Okay, so we put our M there. But it's not Sukumara, but Sukumara with the long R. And so we put our long stroke there. So we've got now su ku sukuma. And the final letter, sukumara. This is the letter r. This Final syllable is just the r with a short a r. So all we need to do is to write our r with nothing else, and that's automatically a r with a short a. So here we have first line now on the iPad screen is sukumara. So as I say, a fair bit of learning to do, but once you learn it, you've got it for all time because it, there won't be any surprises for you afterwards. So let's get back to where we were. Oh, right, this is that, um, you see that slightly disconcerting shape that I've highlighted there, that's the D. The Nirudyama, Nirudyama. There we are in large type for you. You can see the characteristic part where I'm showing the characteristic the and the characteristic of the year kind of joined together in, in one. Not all of the ligatures are, are complex, most of them are. You're perfectly obvious. Um, let's get rid of that. For example, hasta. Let's look at hasta. Hasta. So we're going off, off a, bit, a bit off track here, but it's all good stuff, and you'll need to know. It'll make the egginess easier for you. Hasta. Meaning, meaning a hand. So. This is the her. Ha. So we've got the sir, and we've got the ta. Now, if we wrote it like that, James, to the, the um, notepad. Sorry, sorry, thank you. I better keep a score of how many times I forget and see whether you know, as, the, as the lessons progress, I'm getting better, better, better or worse. <laughs> so, hasta, if we wrote it like that, it would be hasata. Because this S here is written in its full form. Odin, thank you, dear, not to be confused with ga. Yeah, I'll, thank, thanks for that. I'll, I'll, I'll come, come to that in a moment. Very good point. If we have hasata, um, is a different word from hasta. In fact, hasata is the, an imperative plural, laugh, telling somebody, telling people to laugh. But hasta, look now what I'm doing. There's the ha. 
Watch now what I'm doing to make hasta, the syllable sta. Watch here. I've written there the characteristic element of the s. Remember, that's the characteristic element with its upright and its crossbar. There's a second. I've written here the characteristic element of it. But to that characteristic element, I then add the full letter ta. So these is called a ligature, a tying together, a binding together of two, two consonants. So this now is hasta. But even if you'd never seen this conjunction before, you'd be able to detect that that was a sta, because you see the characteristic shape of that s followed by the full ta. Odin mentioned the, not to confuse between the g, yeah, actually, yes. The g, that's a g. The dia, the, the difference, they are quite similar, but you see this one starts towards the left and the dia starts more, more towards the, towards the right. And it's not really an effort of learning. Well, I don't think so. Any. Mind you, I did start 55 years ago. But the, the point is, it becomes easy to remember. If you say, how is it uh, written? It's written like that. And that's why this beginning of the D, of the D, you see the beginning of the writing of the D element is the same as where it is as in a letter on, it, on its own. That's where it's D. It starts over, starts towards the right because of its inherent shape like that. Hopefully you aren't blowing too many fuses in your brains. Anyway, shall we, um, we could go back now to the, um, to the, to the text. So, Uh, so just one more thing. This Sandhi between Mrityu Grasto Marakara, here the very letter I've been talking about. Look at that there on the screen. That's you, you can see the st there, the S followed by the T. And this shape after it is the O, sto. Let me just give that to you on iPad. We want store. That goes. That's the star. Okay, Odin wants me to. Owen really wants some punishment. Okay, Odin, you can have it. Um, star. That's star. Now I've told you. That if you want, if you want to make that star, you just add this long bar there. That becomes star. To make it into an O, there. That is now store. So it's like the R, but with this, with this kind of tail on top. Store, a store. As we have. In Mrityu Grasto, that's where my cursor's playing me up. Mrityu Grasto, there where I've highlighted. You see in the next word, there's something that looks like a big S. That, that does, that's the equivalent of an apostrophe that represents the missing A. So it's meant to be, it would have been grasta amarakara, but it's become grasto marakara with this symbol. The same as our apostrophe indicating that um, 
that the, the R has been dropped. So it's written like that. And that symbol, this is a fun word here. I'm going to look, show you a word that looks very outlandish and foreign, but in fact, we use it in modern English in a slightly different form. It's the avagraha. Avagraha means taking away. It shows that the, it's just a symbol. This, this symbol here is like an apostrophe in place of the missing a. And the avagraha, ava is cognate with our English word off. And graha, also grabha, is cognate with our English word grab. So it's the off grab. It means a, sing, a symbol to indicate that the a ah has been off grabbed, has been grabbed off, has been dropped. So the avagraha. So, hatosmi, look at this. Hatosmi, I'm a dead man, I am killed. Look, look at me writing this now. That would be hatta, but it's hatto, hatto, then the avagraha to indicate the missing a. Smi, characteristic form of the S, followed by the M. Hatto smi. Now, just to give you something that's real fun, you will have noticed that you would have expected me to write something like this sm and some symbol here to represent the short e. <laughs> no. This is it's okay, okay, it's the only there's one single vowel in the whole of the Devanagari script that behaves like this. So don't worry, this is the only one where you have a short e. The symbol for it is written before the consonant. So, say you want to write T plus E, that's the, this is a ta plus E. The short E on its own is, is written like this. If you write a consonant followed by a short E, you write the E first. So this actually is T. Again, you get used to that. When I first started writing Devanagari, very slowly, painstakingly in my first week of learning, I was constantly forgetting, you see, and then I didn't leave space for the E. I would have to say a rude word, you see, and then you know, cram the E in that um, I, I'd forgotten. And so iti, we know the word iti meaning thus. This is a good example. So writing the word the e, and we write that in its full form because it begins the word or begins the word group. So you see this symbol for the e, it's, it's like the long stroke of the r, but it's written first, and it's got its little tail there. By the way, this is not totally perverse. There is actually a historical reason for it that I'll give you now. In the very, very old days, again, take me to the very old days, um, you see this in the very ancient forms of the script. It's specific now. The short, it's an T, I'm going to write T, the short E was actually written from there and a little curl to the left. That was the short T written on top. And this was the long E written as a curl, little curl, but the other way on top. And as time went on, as the script developed, what happened was that this little curl was written, but then dropped down to the bottom. So that was how it, it originally was. But it's now written, we, we write it now like that. 
By the way, some people will insist that you write it with the curl first and then the T. It's purely a matter of style. You can write it like that or like that. I prefer to write it like this simply because I'm not a very brilliant calligrapher and it tends to come out a bit neater like that. But it's, it's pure, purely a matter of style. Don't let anyone tell you that one is right and the other is wrong. It's pure, purely a matter of um, personal style. Right. Odin wanted a bit of punishment with Dukita. Okay, blame Odin for this, not me. Here we go. Dukita. Actually, it's not so bad. With all the explanation I've done, it's not too bad. We've got the D. Here's the word for you. Sorry, my cursor is seriously playing me up. Yeah. This is the word we're looking at. Dukita. So we've got the D. And we've got these two dots. And we've got that, which is a, this is a dot on its own. And we've got the ta. Now. James, no pad, James. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry. So I was just writing the da plus the that two dots, which is the, the symbol for the subdotted H, the visarga, the k and the ta. By the way, you may think that the k looks a bit like a r and a v. Well, okay, it does look a little bit like that. Just remember, as a the symbol single letter k, they're written close together like that, so that, that makes a, a k. In practice, in practice, there'll never be amb any ambiguity, particularly in in printed books. It'll be very distinct whether it's a r followed by a v or a k as a single letter. So, du kita. Okay, we want to make the da into a du. So, we already know what to do. We put this little hook under the, under here. So, this becomes a du. Sorry, short u, du. But the, a long u is the same kind of curl, but going the other way like that. So that's, that's a long u. So, du. This du kita. Du. So we put this these two dots representing the visarga, that's the subdotted H, du. The next syllable, do it by syllables rather than letters. The next syllable is ki. I made the mistake, as I was telling you earlier on, um, when I was learning to write for the first time thinking in terms of letters, a k, ooh, we now write a k, and then write the e, no. Think of the entire syllable, ki, short e. Therefore, start with that downstroke, which is going to be a part of our e, then the k, to do ki, ki, do ki, and ta. Now you will have noticed that in these cases, I've put the crossbar, I've written that at the end, and that's the normal way of writing it in Devanagari script. I should mention that I'm not a brilliant calligrapher, but if you just go onto Devanagari handwriting, Devanagari calligraphy, there's just so much really good stuff. On, on, on the web and you can sit back and watch any, any amount of um, any amount of writing lessons. So for example, the word hasta I've written it like that and then you put the crossbar along the top. That's the most common way of doing it in De Devanagari. Um, again, it's it's not mandatory but it works out neater and it's how, how it's most com commonly done. So this hopefully has eased the path a little way and shown show you there's great logic to it and say, once you've learned it, once you've got, got it for all time. So before we wind up, I shall just go through once more, read it once more. 
Um, before we go, um, were there any any queries arising out of this? And um, if there were any, if you don't get a chance to say it, you're always very welcome to put it up in the um, in the the questions box on the on the Buddhist Society website, or indeed email me. And now you've now you've got the um, now you've got the e email address. So here we go. One last time. Mm, oops, sorry. Nirudyama palakankshin sukumara bahuvyata. Mrityugrasto marakara ha dukita vihanyase. Nirudyama palakankshin sukumara bahuvyata. Mrityugrasto marakara ha dukita vihanyase. Good. Well, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Uh, sorry, James. Um, it's uh, Chris please. Allen. Uh, uh, Chris. It's just, yeah, um, just before Sukumara, is there a problem with the E construction? I, was, I thought the, um, the E construction should start with the kus, the, the conjunct, rather than with the um, nasal. Ah, sorry. You're showing where they've written it like this. Yeah. Okay. I was expecting the loop to start, um, the vertical okay. bar to appear between, uh, after the, con the, <laughs> the nasal sound and before the conjunct. Okay. And the loop to start uh, attached to the conjunct. Okay. Um, this could have been written. You will see here, this letter, this is a ng. Yeah. Sorry, the, this is the letter ng. Sorry, let me do it on my iPad. It'll be clearer. Letter ng. You should write like that. Some people write it like that. It's the same. Ng. Mm -hmm. Now, where you have a difficult ligature, a difficult conjunct, you get too many in, you're allowed to cheat slightly. The, you could write like that. You can squash the n and then put the ksh under that. Oh, right. You can, yeah. you can do that. Yeah. In these, in this is an electronic typeface you've just been looking at. Yeah. The more advanced the typeface, the more the more careful will they be about making the complex ligatures. But where it just gets a little bit too complex, you're allowed to cheat slightly and write the consonant, not with the ligature, but with the virama under it. Okay. To show you that it's all this, this is pronounced as a uh, nksh. Right. Now, you're, you are thinking this is n followed by ksh. Therefore, why isn't it written like this? Is that what you were asking? Mm? No, uh, yes, yes. That All right. Vertical. Yeah, the answer the... is, the answer is, even though you write it with a virama, it is treated as one single consonant cluster. All oh, right. So it's a single consonant cluster, the unksh. And because it's a single cluster, the, you have to put its vowel, the E, in front of it. Right, right. right. So, asti, look at, look at it in, in this way. Asti. You've got your consonant cluster of st there, and you put the E in front of it. So, you treat the consonant cluster as a single unit. Okay. However many consonants there are in it, for the purpose of the syllable and for the purpose of writing the vowels, and especially the, the E, treat it as if it were one single unit. That explains why we have this odd-looking thing there. Yeah. So ho hopefully that, that will... Um, that will. I'm very glad you raised that point. Um, nice one. Yeah. So um, that, that is the uh, explanation for it.
yeah, gentlemen, I'm wondering why there isn't a, a, a ha to start the whole David Argery script to correspond with your Roman script in Hey You. Is that just poetic license on your part? Sorry, where? Um, with you, you, you have a harp for Hey Sufferer, but um, with Hey You at the beginning, there's the David Argery doesn't have a harp for the Hey. Is this just um, okay, okay. License on your okay, okay. It's not my part. I've actually here borrowed it from, but I'm doing it less and less as I go along. I started borrowing from the is it the Skelton Crosby translation, which is an I think Pengu Penguin Classics. Um, I'm actually doing another translation. The, the, the more I go along, the more I'm seeing that sometimes they haven't quite spotted it. Then it would they have excellent scholars, but they may have been doing it a bit of a hurry. Here, this is not a hurry. Hey, you. Um, they put this in just, I think, just as a slight poetic license, bearing in mind they were doing it for a different purpose. They were doing it to show people what the Bodhicherry Avatara said. Um, and so they put, hey, you, just by way of general indication that everything that follows was in the vocative. You're being shouted at. Oi. Um, yeah. in, in the Sanskrit, it's obvious because the Palakank Shin Sukumardra, Bahuvyata, these are all vocatives. So you know that you're being spoken to. We, that doesn't quite work in English. So it's just a way of emphasizing yeah. that he's, he's shouting yeah. at you. Yeah. So, yes, it, it is license. Yeah. So I say this translation, this, this is an addition that I did a while ago without all the um, detailed, uh, detailed annotations. This was something I put in as a, a, a slight help to, to an understanding. I think we'll, we'll phase it out as we go along and I'll, I'll, I'll replace it with my own translation. Yeah. Uh, and finally, James, I, I believe that Panini had a whole pile of sutras to control the or to define how the rules of Santi. Will, will, is that correct? And will you be teaching this that sort of thing in the fullness of time? <laughs> yes. Um... <laughs> Yeah, um, it's just, it's not exactly bedtime reading. This actually is an edition that has got, um, you know, the Sanskrit, Panini Sanskrit, and with an English tr 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 translation. You know, it's um, Panini didn't go in for these little kind of ready reference tables, you know, everything on one page at a glance. You know, there's very considerable detail in, in, in P P P Panini. In fact, before, even before I started, um, when I was in very early stages discussing this Sanskrit teaching venture with, um, with your illustrious president, Desmond. Desmond said, well, how about doing Panini's mighty work? I, my response to that really is, um, okay, okay, I've only been doing Sanskrit for 55 years. As soon as I start understanding it a bit better, then maybe I'll feel I can teach Panini. But at the moment, I'll stick to um, Shantideva. I can feel fairly confident that I'm getting <laughs> Shantideva right. I think the, um, the number of students would very rapidly dwindle, as is the strength of my arm holding his books up. The number of students would dwindle if we tried to do Panani. So just, um, let's just <laughs> stick. Stick, I'll, I'll, stick to what we can do first. I'll take that as a no then. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for that, Chris. Okay, I better cut now. I've got my party class starting and I've got to um, email the links to a couple of you. Um, okay, so see some of you in a few minutes' time and most of you next week. Good. Thank you very much to all. Thank you. Bye. Bye.